Okay, so here's the second part of our module on motion with constant acceleration. We're, we had our uh, fundamental relationships, and we want to use them to look at the following conditions, where we have uh, one-dimensional motion, constant acceleration, and we have two points in time, uh, t initial and t final, and we want to build relationships between the initial position and velocity and time to the final position, velocity, and time. What we had from our last module is these expressions that give us the, uh, the general functions from t is equal to zero, and now we want to extend on that, assuming we sort of have two, uh, two initial and final points in time. Okay, so in this case, if I want to look at now differences, between velocities. So we have a vx final minus x component of velocity initial. This is now the difference between velocity and two points in time, and this is now the definite integral from t initial to t final of our acceleration function with respect to time. Now this is just a constant, so this is quite easy. This is acceleration times uh, just a t evaluated between t initial and t final. a t is the antiderivative, and so that's equal to a, I plug in t sub f into t minus plug in t sub i, and this now I can represent the difference in time I can represent as delta t. So this is equal to a delta t. So I can combine those two to give me a new uh, expression relationship which says the final x component of the velocity is equal to the initial component of the velocity plus uh, acceleration times the time interval between these two points. Well that's mighty convenient and it looks really uh, quite familiar and so if I'm, our initial time is zero then v initial is v naught and then uh, t final minus t naught this is zero is just t final which would give us our our final t there. But note that the if the initial is not necessarily at t is equal to zero, v zero here is defined here for time is equal to zero. So this initial time here could be something else. And so that's that's why we're doing this, so we can uh, uh, look for differences between initial times and final times that aren't necessarily t is equal to zero. So let's Let's go ahead and now look at uh, x f, f minus x initial. We want to look at the relationships between these two. Well, this is now the definite integral between time initial and time final of our velocity function. Our velocity function, remember, is this one. So that's uh, v naught minus a t d t. So I can calculate this. This is v naught, the antiderivative, v naught t plus one half a t squared evaluated between t initial, t final. And if I uh, plug in t f into there, it gives me v naught t f plus one half a t f squared, then minus uh, the values when I plug in t sub i, so that's v naught t i minus one half a t i squared. All right. So if I were to now sort of put all this uh, together here into something, sort of combine these terms, I get uh, x f is equal to x i 
plus, I'll recombine my V naught, T F minus T I plus one half uh, A T F squared minus one half A T I squared. Okay, so th this is not really satisfactory um, because it doesn't, in fact, give us um, relationships between uh, v initial and v final. It still has this v naught in here. That's the t is equal to zero. That's not what I'm interested in. And also, what I'd really like is is uh, expressions in terms of the time difference. And and so, just this expression as written isn't quite what I want. So this requires a little bit more of algebra and we might have to suffer through this a little bit, but the payoff is really important. We only have to do this once and then we can use it for uh, a large range of problems that we want to solve. Okay, so remember V naught, I can come up with a relationship between the initial velocity and V naught using our initial function. So note that V initial is equal to the velocity at T initial. That's the, the definition. And so that's equal to V naught plus A T initial. So using this, I can solve for V naught in terms of v initial and t initial. And now I can plug this into v naught here to be able to remove it from my expression. So this gives me x final is equal to x initial plus now v i minus a t i times t f minus t i. Okay, and so I could be done here. I now have everything in terms of my initial final positions and velocities. But as it turns out, uh, I don't want to stop there. I want to make things as simple and straightforward as possible, so I'm going to work with my final expression, massage it a little bit to be able to get it in, in sort of the, the most simplified manner possible, see what sort of uh, terms uh, cancel, what sort of terms combine, what sort of physical insight does that tell me about my problem. And you can say what I'm really doing is, is massaging it till I get the answer that the book gives, and to a certain degree that's true, but also the exercise here is real. This is also the sort of thing that scientists and engineers do when doing this type of problem. Once you get just any answer, you always work with the terms to see how they simplify, uh, how the terms relate to each other to see whether there's physical insight in your result. So let's t do some of that with, with this problem here. And so I have x sub i, plus, I'm going to multiply this through, I have V sub I times T sub F minus T sub I minus, and then I multiply these two terms together, A T I T F plus A T I squared, that's this multiplied by each of those two terms. And then I have these left over, so plus one-half a t f squared minus one-half a t i squared. So how does all this come together? I can recombine these terms, and so I get x i plus v i uh, t f minus t i. And so this is plus one half a t f squared. I'm going to write this in a suggestive manner. Minus a t i t f plus one half a t i squared. And you might 
immediately recognize that this is one half a t f minus t i squared. And so we arrive at x f is equal to x i plus v i t f minus t i plus one half a t f minus t i squared. And again, I can might find it convenient. Delta t is equal to t f minus t i, and now I have finally my final position is equal to my initial position plus my initial velocity times the time interval plus one half the acceleration times the time interval squared. And so was this really all worth it? I mean I could have just written that down since I knew what the answer was. Here's my my uh, my combination. I'll get this down here too. But it's important to know uh, where these I think where these come from but also see this type of process where we uh, derive expressions from more fundamental relationships that we can now use any time these two equations we use any time that uh, these conditions are valid with one dimensional constant acceleration where I have two specific points in time t initial and t final I now have the relationships between xi vi and the initial time and the final position velocity and time all right now I'm not quite done. I have one more thing I can do. In many examples, let's say I have an object between two points in time, and I know, say, some part of the change in position. I want to know something about the change in velocity or vice versa. I don't know the time, nor do I care. It'd be interesting to use these to come up with a relationship that only uh, involves delta x and delta v and does not involve delta t at all. And I can do that because I can solve this one for delta t. Delta t is equal to vf minus vi over a. Substitute that into this and come up with a new expression. If I do that, I find I, I can derive that vf squared is equal to vi squared plus 2a xf minus xi. So that gives me a third relationship. I'm not going to go through all the algebra for that. That's not that interesting. But now I have three relationships that uh, combine the terms that I'm interested in. But one final warning. I only have two linearly independent equations. Independent equations. Why is that important? If you're an accomplished algebraicist, you've often been told that as long as you have the same number of equations as unknowns, you can solve for your unknowns. If you have two unknowns, you need two equations. If you have three unknowns, you need three equations. Well, that's not exactly true. What's true is you need the same number of linearly independent equations as you have uh, as, as you have unknowns. And in that case, here you have two linearly independent equations. That's because we used these two to derive the third. So while we have three equations, if you can only use this amount of information to solve for two unknowns, and that can't, that will come up in some of the problems. And so that's a, an important feature to, to understanding how this equation is different than those two.